recap. So we um, talked about, we laid out how we got here. We laid out the law and we were applying the law to the facts. We talked about intent to dominate and systematic oppression. The third element you need is the inhumane acts. And Human Rights Watch concluded that Israeli authorities have committed five clusters of inhumane acts. That's not an exhaustive list. That's just the five that we focused on for this report. Let me briefly go through them. We talked about the also we have a permit rich Palestinians needing difficult to obtain permits to enter large sections of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, occupied East Jerusalem. So, for example, while probably everybody on this call, minus me, could get on an airplane and go to Tel Aviv and drive to East Jerusalem or the West Bank, Palestinians who live there cannot do so with a very difficult to obtain permit. There are also nearly 600 checkpoints and other closure obstacles, most of which are between Palestinian communities, which can turn a short commute into work or school into an hours long humiliating ordeal. And there's a separation barrier, twice the length of the Berlin Wall um, that's largely built on Palestinian land that separates Palestinian communities from Home, their schools and hospitals and larger networks and communities. So that's one cluster of what we determine to be inhumane acts, which are the movement restrictions. Secondly, we talk about the expropriation of Palestinian land. One third of the West Bank, uh, one third of East Jerusalem have been expropriated from Palestinians using various legal ta tactics and when redistributed largely gone to settlers. Um, this has reduced Palestinians to living in what uh, B'Tselem, the Israeli Human Rights Group, calls 167 non-contiguous territorial islands. Really mass, two million dunams of land, and of course there's been millions of lands confiscated from Palestinians inside Israel, um, and this is really a significant human rights issue. So the land expropriation, the movement restrictions, the third one we talk about are um, the policies, the coercive policies that amount to forcible transfer. Now, in East Jerusalem and the majority of the West Bank under Israel's exclusive control, it's effectively impossible for a Palestinian to get a building permit. Between 2016 and 2018, according to Israeli government data, the Israeli government issued 100 times more demolition orders then building permits for Palestinians living in, Ar in Area C, the majority of the West Bank, where Israel has exclusive control. Now, this leads to a reality where Palestinians build because they need homes and schools and businesses. And every year, hundreds of those are demolished um, for lacking a building permit that they can't get. Meanwhile, Jewish settlements, Israeli settlements, are expanding at incredibly alarming rates. So these policies amount to forcible transfer, which is one of the express inhumane acts set out under the legal bodies that we referenced. The last two inhumane acts I would mention are, are um, the, the uh, mass suspension of civil rights to millions of Palestinians, you know, the, the nearly 5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza that for generations haven't had the right to free expression, assembly, association. You could get a 10 year jail sentence um, for protesting uh, for this gathering. If we had it in person in Bethlehem, uh, you know, without a permit from the Israeli army, we could all be arrested uh, for joining a hostile political organization. So imagine you, your grandmother, your grandfather, your father, your mother, your kids, no civil rights for 55 years. And then fifth and finally, the last thing you may act we talk about is um, that the fact that nearly half a million Palestinians have lost their right to reside in the occupied Palestinian territory solely because they were abroad for too long. They, uh, they were not there when the occupation began, similar to what I described in Jerusalem a bit ago. It's happened over decades in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. All this together is what led Human Rights Watch to reach the conclusion of apartheid or persecution. It's not the only place in the world we've reached this determination. Uh, we also found the treatment of the Rohingya in Myanmar amounted to apartheid and persecution. We also found crimes against humanity like persecution in China's treatment of the Uyghur, Uyghurs. And the recommendations in our report are consistent with where we've reached those other determinations. It basically amounts to accountability 
So ensuring that the perpetrators are investigated and prosecuted, including by international criminal court, including by national courts under the principle of universal jurisdiction, that there are targeted sanctions, asset freezes and travel bans against the perpetrators to deter future abuses, um, and that the UN really investigates this and recognizes this. Beyond that, and other countries do the same, the second phase of recommendations are about ending all forms of complicity in these crimes, which include um, suspension of military aid so long as apartheid persecution continues to the Israeli security forces. It includes evaluating all bilateral agreements with Israel to ensure non-complicity in these crimes and ensures similar actions of businesses and other bodies. Um, so let me sort of move towards concluding by really saying, you know, what this all amounts to, because to get to any of these recommendations from the current reality, we have to begin by focusing on recognition of reality for what it is, right? The first, you know, and it goes back to where I started, right? Because, you know, um, so long as the discourse remains not tethered to the reality on the ground, we're not going to get anywhere on human rights advocacy. The first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly. The wrong diagnosis leads to the wrong analysis and the wrong set of recommendations. So let's set the record straight. A 55-year occupation is not temporary. Denying millions of people their basic rights solely because of who they are because they're Palestinian and not Jewish is not simply a matter of an occupation that's gone on for too long or is too abusive. Democracy, as Hagai Lad, my friend from Beth Salem, says, is rule of the people, not rule of one people over another. A daily reality, today we're seeing news of 10 Palestinians killed in Nablus, a daily reality of structural violence, a daily reality of structural repression is not a conflict between two equal parties. A system methodically engineered to ensure one people prosper at the expense of another people is not a conflict between two equal parties. Apartheid is not some future hypothetical scenario. Let's remember Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister warned of apartheid in 1974. Jimmy Carter, who we may be among our last days with us on this earth, wrote a book in 2006, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. John Kerry in 2014, nine years ago, said apartheid was a year or two away. Palestinians have been describing apartheid as their lived reality for years, if not decades, and not enough of us listen. But the finding of apartheid is not just the opinion of Human Rights Watch. Amnesty International reached the same conclusion. So did many prominent Israeli human rights groups, including when this new government was formed in, in December, 27 Israeli rights groups use the word apartheid to describe Israel's treatment of Palestinians. The Human Rights Clinic, leading UN experts, several major ones of them, including the ones in charge with human rights and the OPT, have reached the conclusion of apartheid. And it's not just human rights advocates. We have an op-ed in Le Monde from the end of last year by five former European foreign ministers. We have hundreds of European parliamentarians. Former attorney general, deputy attorney general, former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa, the former director general of Israel's foreign ministry, who was one of those two ambassadors, have, current members of the Knesset, have all described Israel's treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. And, and the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, I actually come for some time, but there are also governments that have done this, including the governments of South Africa and Namibia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the entire African. Arab blocks at the UN, including the Organization of Islamic Conference, and even the foreign ministers of France and um, Luxembourg have referenced apartheid in relation to Israel's treatment of Palestinians. There is a consensus today in the global human rights movement and increasingly beyond, but more needs to be done.
right? We need that to become, there's still pockets of governments that have not recognized apartheid, including in Europe and the United States, where many of you are from. There still are prominent political parties and voices. And really, no matter what you believe is the future solution, the first step is to recognize the reality for what it is and take the steps necessary to end it. So with that, I'll conclude and I look forward to um, the remaining time for discussion.